welcome to the Henry Books podcast. Today we have Adam Courtney, who is an author and business journalist with 30 years experience in print newspapers and magazines, including Forbes, the Financial Times and Company Director magazine. Adam has also written five full-length non-fiction books, including Amazon Men, The Ship That Never Was, The Ghost and the Bounty Hunter, and Three Sheets to the Wind. Um, Adam had extensive experience working on manuscripts for private clients, which involve all facet of book writing, structuring, and positioning. Thanks a lot for coming on the podcast, Adam. Thank you for having me, Jess. I'm really glad to be on. And it's exciting that you are going to be part of the Henry Books team doing some book coaching and some manuscript assessments. Yeah, no, no, fantastic. Look, it's it's a great thing. I think it's almost, uh, it's formalising what I've been doing for a lot of people uh, for quite a long time now. So, yeah, it's great to be, actually have it properly formalised as a book coach and, and giving some manuscript advice. I mean, I wish I had something like this available when I started out. Um, but I was groping in the dark when I started out, but that was a long time ago. Um, but I get I get people sending me MSs, manuscripts all the time. Mm. And I always wanted to help as best as I can. And, and I think doing this with you, and I really love what Henry Books is doing, it gives structure to what I've been doing and I really welcome it. So I hope, you know, I just hope I can offer would-be writers a benefit of some of my own experiences as a writer. Mm, I'm sure you will do. Um, now, the topic, so the topic today is a craft topic. Normally on the podcast, we do sort of the nuts and bolts of publishing. So this will be really enjoyable. And something you and I have chatted about several times yeah. is the premise of show, don't tell. Can you begin by explaining what that means? Right. Well, look, the most important thing, what, what is show about? And it's to me, it's all about, it all ends in one thing. It's about revealing a person or a set of people can not just one person it's about revealing character or it can be about you know as i say a bunch of characters and how they deal with the situation now a classic example uh is um you could be doing a history book for say on the laws of england i'm just pu pull this one out of the hat the laws of england in 1850 but have you got an actual court case of what that period is like how did it actually work show what i'm saying with the show is show me a court case scene in real time which involves the laws that we're talking about in the background. To show me the arcane judges, show me the judge who hasn't got a clue, show me the prejudices of the day, show me the blindness of justice. Hmm. Now, example is, I, I, for instance, just, just the other day, and this is absolutely true, I spoke to a friend, she's doing a very long and tortuous PhD on the history of abortion laws in Australia. Now, it's an interesting topic, I think. I I'm thought, thought to myself, ah, oh, I don't know how that changed. I'd be interesting to know how, how, that, you know, how those laws have worked. She then tells me she wants to convert it afterwards into a commercial non-fiction book, i.e. a kind of popular history. So, the, so there's always going to have to be a lot of backstory explaining what the laws were, perhaps the reaction to them from women, of course, and from men too, what the taboos were, what women had to do to get an abortion, how effective were the methods, what were the social mores relating to the abortion. And then I said to her, um, where are the cases and how will you write them up? And she said, oh, yeah, I'm going to have little boxes, case A, case B. And I said, wait a sec, wait a sec. What about their stories? Tell me what they went through. Give me a scene. Uh, uh, even you can in invent half of the scene if you like. I'll explain that later. But as long as the facts of that person as we know them remain sacrosanct, then you can build a scene on it. Now, there's the show. Suddenly, all the backstory, the narration, the laws you're talking about, they come to life. What she had to deal with. How did her friends react? Where did she go? What were the doctors? Or you might well, some people would call them butchers, perhaps. Yeah. Um, yeah. You have quite a lot of carte blanche to invent a scene. Fiction does this. Nonfiction can do it as well, I believe. I want... What I'm ending up here is that I want all roads, all the context, all the background, all the history, I want all roads to lead to a scene, a scene that encapsulates the problem in real living time. That is far more effective in telling the history than me going on about abortion laws in Australia in 1850. Mm. Um, so can I, as I said before earlier, can I offer the reader a court case with the same period which shows what happened with the laws? Mm. Why would I do that? Because the show reveals character. It reveals fears, it reveals needs, it reveals wants, it shows motivation, it shows desperation, it allows emotion to enter the fray. And readers, I think, love emotional content. That mm. way they can bond with the character. So I hope that explains the difference. 
Instead of saying, no, that's a perfect example. Instead of saying, you know, Australia in the 1890s was full of prejudice towards, you know, women and exactly. Exactly. rights, that is telling and showing is a scene where a woman is being prosecuted for, yeah. yeah. It's, something that's not even her fault. And that's where you show, that's what the show is important. It shows, and that's where people begin to really understand exactly what this period was like. So you're showing the history with a character. Mm. If you see what I mean. And what happens if an author, I definitely have a tendency to tell. I think my early drafts is a bit of a telling. And then yeah. I go back and I have to, not not all the time, but quite often. What yeah. happens if all we do is tell? Well, I can, I can tell, I'm exactly, this, I was exactly the same when I started out. Um, I was just telling the story, bang, 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 bang. And then uh, I got, the editor came back to me with my very first book, which I was edited with a, with a big publisher. We need some. We need. We need some scenes here, Adam. And I go, oh yeah, right. Actually, <laughs> I mean, so it's not always. I'm not saying telling is not a bad thing. I don't want this to mm. show is better than tell. Um, what most of what we will do will be telling. Telling the state story gives context, explains the circumstances, gives a sense of the zeitgeist, the place of the history. It also moves the action. It's important. It's extremely important. It's what we mostly do. But I think too many history writers or uh, non-fiction writers as a whole simply tell. They forget there are human beings who are affected by the very things you're telling them about. Yeah. So many history writers do this. Some people like it. Some people, I've been reading some histories that just tell the whole way through. Um, but And there's no emotional content. Mm. In a non-fiction, fiction, you can do tell without show, but you can't do very good show without tell. I hope that makes sense. Um, when you you have to tell a lot before you can show. You have to explain the circumstances before you give the scene that that really encapsulates it. Mm. All history needs context and backstory and facts and all that sort of stuff. It's not to say it's a bad thing, but there is. I can't. I wish I could give you a general rule. You you need to break up the story with both. But generally, mm. the backstory. I think should. I think the way it should work. Generally, not always, but I, you should. The backstory should lead to a great scene, a, a wonderful denouement. I love this word, denouement. <laughs> uh, it's a French word, but I use it all the time. It's a show, make me sound very smart. So, how cold? Denouement. <laughs> but, but because the way that I see it, because if you're already armed with the facts and the backstory, you can then just enjoy the scene and understand what it means and, to, and the context of all of it. Then you feel, I believe, you feel fulfilled as a reader. Always make your narrative lead to a show which shows a person, a person who is trapped inside a history that you've already mostly told. I hope that makes sense. No, that's great. That's great. Sometimes when um, I'm saying to a client, you know, can you put together your chapter outlines and think of your book in scenes, as in the actors walk onto a stage and they begin the scene, what is that scene? So that, yeah. you know, it's not, I think there's a big tendency to, to fill the start of a book with backstory. Yeah. Would you agree? Uh, there is. I, I, I often st I start all my books with a um, with always with a show, um, even though I haven't given anybody any historical background. It just it's just a basic way to get people into the characters, to people to know what the to the who the who they're dealing with, what sort of circumstances they deal, and then the backstory starts afterwards, and then that builds it to another scene. Mostly, that's how mm -hmm. I do it most of the time. So yeah. you've got a whole a whole way of you're moving up. Uh, to a scene and then down with backstory and then back up to a scene. So there's a sort of, uh, I know this sounds scientific, but there's a kind of oscillation going on. Uh, and the scene is the, the the high point of everything you've been telling everybody beforehand. That's how I work a story. That's amazing. That's, yeah, okay. Um, and, and I think also, you know, it's worth saying that um, a show is more emotionally powerful, which I think you did say, but like, Yes. If you say it was the worst day in my life ever, I was so miserable, I've never been so sad, it just has less of an impact than to say, you know, the tears stream down her face yeah, and, exactly. and the words to reply or something. Yes. It's just more moving for some reason. It's the way our yeah. brains are wired. Yeah, our brains are wired to see pictures, to get picturegrams or whatever. I'm not even sure that's the right word, but I'll use it anyway. <laughs> we, 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 um, in fact, my dad had a wonderful word for it, which I forget. I wish I'd remembered it. What was but, your dad? Yeah, well, we'll talk about that sometime. <laughs> but he said, you know, the whole point of it is to be able to fill the brain with a scene so that you really feel it. And I believe in a non-fiction, you can do that 
maybe not quite as well as a fiction because fiction gives you a lot more, you know, you've got more uh, ability to do whatever you like. But what I love about the history is that you're talking about something that's real. It didn't, it's not invented by somebody. And mm. then if you can, if you can fulfill that and show the emotion of a real situation in history, what more could you ask for as a reader in my, in my opinion anyway? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. Now, you your expertise is really historical uh which is that narrative historical is that is that the term? i just call it i just call it popular history popular history making yeah. history i like to I, I have a little thing I, making the history sing is what i call it making it making you feel the history that's what i want yeah, people to do the history that's beautiful Lean, but... or leaning leaning into somebody said somebody once said and i was the best thing someone ever said in a, in a review of mine was we see how adam courtney leans into the history and i went thank you that's exactly what i, I didn't say it myself but he said it the reviewer beautiful. Uh, leaning into it because i want people to feel the history i don't want them to just read it and i want them i want them to know all the context but i want them to feel it as well that's beautiful well, when i did a tour with mum of government house in Parramatta, i was it felt like i'd stepped into a scene from yes. three sheets to the wind i was saying mum mum did you know there was like heaps of rum i never because that blew my mind i never had any idea and it was it was amazing and so i i felt very much because you you described it so vividly and then i was i was like this is adam's world i'm in adam's world <laughs> Oh, well, sucks, sucks. I've, it's worked though. I got you. I would wink you then, Jess, for sure. <laughs> um, okay, backstory. Yes, it's important. How do we handle it? What's your advice to nonfiction writers on a on what is essential, what is non-essential backstory, where to put it? Um, look, it's important, um, as is as everything is important. Uh, try to harness the backstory of, a, as I keep, I know I'm going on about one thing, but try to harness the backstory of a person so as to move into a fully fledged scene. I know I keep saying that, but if you give the story of a, how a man or woman grew up, their social circumstances, their schooling, where they came from, et cetera, make it, make it lead to something. Otherwise it's just pure filler with nowhere to go. So you can tell a thousand facts and ideas about where a person grew up, et cetera, but what does it all mean? And, and you've got to somehow in, in various ways, explain where that, where that, that backstory has a genuine meaning. Um, try to make backstory count. Uh, even better, make it count where people less, least expect is one of my. Ooh, use it if possible to create a scene, if not to guide the narrative. So use it to guide the character and the things he or she does. So something in their backstory makes them react. You've just got to, I can't tell you what that exact thing is, but you'll, you'll see it. You might see it and go, oh, that's interesting. I didn't is there know an that. example from your books that comes to mind about a backstory? The effective use of backstory or how yeah. maybe the reader it's yeah, yeah i can give you an example um yeah. uh let me let me give you an example uh, i'm just trying to think off the top of my head yeah uh i have a story in um a ship that never was where the, the main guy uh jimmy porter um he's just come off the he's not even come off the boat he's on the boat i knew that his backstory was as a whaler so I knew that he was coming to Hobart. He was he was outside. They were waiting to be put on the port. I made this is the backstory. So I, this is where you can invent and be creative. I knew that he'd been a whaler. So um, when when British when, when when Jimmy Porter enters Hobart, he smells whale oil. He's not even got on shore yet. As I said, I make him smell it because I knew I know that. Hobart is a big whaling town. It was one of the biggest in the world in the first 20 years of its existence. Now, Jimmy Porter has worked on whaling ship. That's part of what we know is his backstory. So I make Jimmy connect the dots. If this is a whaling town, then he knows he's going to be comfortable here because he knows whalers. He knows their type. He's been one of them. So I give him an inner voice. This is my kind of town and I'm going to do really well here. I know it will, be, it will be filled with American and British whalers. I know there will be more alcohol than I need. I know there will be prostitutes and loose women. And I also know that there will be many whalers around. So if I befriend them, I will, I will be able to find a way to escape from, my, from being a convict. So that's a little backstory that no one ever thought about with Jimmy Porter being a whaler himself or in, past, in his past life that I can make bring into the action of of uh of what's happening in the in the story mm. um 
so yeah. and and funnily enough that's what ex exactly what he tries to do um i've created fictional thoughts in his brain based on factual things you can be creative in this way you could put ideas into the protagonist's mind that straight factual history would not allow you to do that's why i do the popular history because it has this creative ability within it so i connect dots there that you wouldn't normally do oh, i love that what is, what are some of the other devices that are at the disposal disposal of fiction writers that non-fiction writers can deploy to make their writing have more impact while still being true to it being non-fiction well uh, that's that's a perfect example um i think of i mean let, let me give you another example of, of the same thing you know a person let me make it really simple you know a person is going uh, there's another case I, I, where I used my creative abilities, the fictional abilities. Let's call them creative or fictional. You know that a person is going from being in a jail cell to being deported somewhere, and you know the, the you don't know how he got from the jail cell to the to the to the boat which is going to take him to another prison, but you do know the quickest route. So you know you look at the map of the place that he's moving when, and you look at it from 1830 or whenever it was. And you say he must have gone this way because it's the quickest route. What's along the way? You find there's a famous pub, you find there's a famous theater. You get him to see those things as he goes along, mm. even though he may not have even looked at them in truth. Mm. But you have, a, you have that ability to say that person saw, and then you can talk about all the sort of things that would have, would have happened in those places. That, that Jimmy Porter may, may or may not have seen, but that's still okay because he went from there to there. You haven't changed any one of the facts. He went from A to B, but you can create within that going to A to B something completely creative if you want. I believe you can do that. And a lot of nonfiction writers do this, do exactly that. Mm, I mean, something that I do, and I just think you, you have to do, or your book can almost be unreadable, is the condensing of time. So, you know, if there's like, and I, and I first learned about this because another author in the, in the front of their book said some of the trips were, there were three trips, but you know what? I reduced them to one because it's life is so fragmented that there has to be some kind of condensing. And I think that is, that is absolutely okay. It's another me. very good example of it. You can condense time or you can just simply take things out that happened. Uh, because they're not relevant or material. They're not relevant or they don't help with the, with the flow of the book. Um, exactly right. Um, sometimes you have to just, if you, that, that's one of the things you do, you, what do you leave in and what do you not leave? What do you take out? You're telling a story here. If you don't, if you say that he didn't meet someone, is it going to really matter? Um, but some people say you have to put everything in. I don't think you do. You have to tell that story as best as you can to engage the reader and in not way you're not in any way lying to them. You're mm. just making it much more interesting and bringing the reader into the feeling of it uh, and and taking him, him or her along and keeping them with you for the entire duration yeah, exactly exactly i think it was alfred hitchcock that said that film is life with all the boring bits taken out yeah but very good i'm going to use that thank you yeah. i'm going to use that <laughs> well it's not mine it's alfred hitchcock yeah well i'll steal it and pretend it's mine yeah thank you now you <laughs> often do manuscript assessments um do you often see over description I find yeah. that, you know, when I'm writing travel memoirs, I need to set the scene, especially if I'm traveling to different places. I always yeah. struggle with how much is too much. You know, when <laughs> when am I becoming a bit flowery? You know, and I usually take yeah. out the last sentence in a paragraph. What's your advice on that? Look, it's, there's no, you just, you have to go with your gut, right? And if your gut says, I'm bored with this, this constant, uh, I mean, look, let me give you an example. I'm looking at a manuscript at the moment and it's about a white, uh aussie bloke newly arrived in bali so you know he's a he's a parvenu i think is the word he's you know he's a stranger uh, he's just married a balinese woman now i'm being shown everything that happens between him and his new balinese family uh we're finding that he doesn't know how to use his knife and fork properly we're finding that he doesn't know how to use toilets properly he finally uh, uh, but nothing's actually happening and then yeah. now here there's an example of tons of show but no action yeah, uh, yeah. And what we're doing, what he's trying to do, the, the, the author, is, is to show his feeling of being disenfranchised in a new culture. Uh, I know he's, but he's keeping on about this culture shock. And I, I know how estranged he feels. We get scenes of him and his family and, and, and he can't eat properly, et cetera, et cetera. 
I, I know the character is suffering culture shock, uh, uh, but um, and we, we know he can't handle things, but I need to see something moving. I need to see some momentum. I need to see progression. Mm. If I don't have those, I don't know how the character is progressing. And my number one thing about everything is how is the character progressing and how is the reader going along with the character? Um, so mm. what most of what I'm reading for, about this guy in Bali is it's really well described and he paints some very good scenes. But I'm only getting one thing, how strange the whole place feels and looks to him, how foreign he feels. It's great, but I need to move on and see how he deals with things. Mm. Um, so there's not enough progression there. Um, and our knowledge of a character, which I think is what really people enjoy, is, is being involved with a character. It only improves, our knowledge of a character only improves with the action and the reaction as things happen. So you have to create things. If he wants that sense of estrangement, let me see more things happen. I mean, he's not doing that, and that's what I've told him. <laughs> In the end, it's about moving things along. You're meant to excite the reader with new Wait. content and new circumstances. Yeah, okay, okay. Um, you're currently finishing the manuscript of a biography of your father, the legendary Bryce Courtney. Has it been a challenging project? Oh, yeah. Um, look, here's the funny thing about it. Uh, it, it has been difficult. Um, I sometimes feel like I was being disloyal. I, I'm being disloyal to him. Uh, that I, I'm revealing things about him that he didn't want revealed in his own life. You know, your average person has a right of reply, and I'm not giving it to him, am I? He can't say that's not fair or that's not right from the grave. He can't respond. So I feel sometimes like I'm betraying him. Um, yeah. And that's the feeling I've had throughout the whole thing. Um, then there's a problem of balance. Um, balance is really difficult. What to add in? What do you leave out? Who might sue me? Who will be upset by what I said? What will my family think? Um, am I being fair? Others may interpret things differently. There could be any kinds of criticism. Um, so what we, what I'm dealing with here is an emotional problem, not a literary or intellectual one. Um, yeah. What we've been talking about here are intellectual problems, how to gain the reader's confidence um, and, and, and bring them along, hopefully, that they'll love the history with knowing the character. But this was a different thing. This was an emotional one. Um, I mean, unlike a history pro pro project, this is this was, funnily enough, intellectually quite easy. I knew exactly what the story was. I, I, I could, and it just came out, like, very, very easily. Mm. But also, I am in this book, and I am exposed. I have skin in the game. People will make judgments on what I've said, done, etc. I am opening myself up to criticism, and that's not what you do when you keep, when you do a hands, uh, you know, hands off history. Also, there's a million fans of Bryce's out there who think he was God's gift to everything, and he wanted people to think he was. People sometimes don't like their heroes to be trashed. Now, mm. I don't feel I'm trashing him, but I am doing my best to reveal him for the good, the bad, and the ugly. So yes, it's always that hard line to walk. How much do you put in? What do you withhold? Et cetera, et cetera. And nothing could be more personal than a book about no. your late father. Why has the book been so important to you to write? I mean, he, yeah, why? Look, I, I, um, there's been so much BS, I won't use the word, but so much crap about him. Much of it's been in the press and a great deal of it I think was stoked by himself to create a myth around himself, only a small part of which is true. That myth still endures. I get people saying, your dad did this and he didn't. So when you're being told by people who just believe what he told them or heard something or heard a rumor, and you, you I, I've spent my last, since he died, the last 10, 12 years saying, no, it didn't happen. It didn't happen. No, it wasn't true. Um, Another book has been written, I won't go into this, except to say the person writing it is unqualified. Um, I was with him for the first 50 years of his of my life and I'm qualified, that's all I'll say about that. Yeah. Um, I was asked, here's an example, I was asked by two publishers to write a memoir of him just after he died, after he died, like literally within a week. Uh, because they, this is the way publishers think, uh, it was hot. Bryce had just died, he's in the press, and that's not a reason to do it. Um, just because it's commercially hot doesn't mean I'm going to do it. Um, yeah. Fact is, I always wanted to do this, but I wanted to be an author in my own right, just not just another son or daughter who's yeah. writing about their famous relative. No, it's no disrespect to those who write about their dads or mums or whatever. 
Mm. Um, but that's not why I'm in this game. I'm in it as a writer per se. Um, mm. Now, I'll tell you this much. It didn't end up all that well between Bryce and I. I don't, I don't want to say it was terrible. It was just not great, I think is the way to put it. Now, I needed time and distance. To get a proper perspective, you need a lot of time and you need displacement, I think, away from, um, from, from, from the subject. With Bryce, there was a before fame period and there was an after fame period. Now, I love the before fame period, if you know what I mean. Yeah. That's when I was closest to him, but not the fame period. That's when I was least close to him. So if I wrote just after he died, which was the fame period, of course, which I disliked, that would have been uppermost in my mind. Um, and I would have been prejudiced about what I said. But if I waited, which I have, it's been 12 years since he died, mm. um, then the whole story of him comes to mind. Uh, that way I'm going to be balanced, not just reacting to something after the fact. Um, so that's why it's taken so long. I'm ready now. I, I've lost a lot of my anger from the after fame phase that I'm talking about. And I can do this proper, I think I believe I can do this whole subject proper justice. Mm. Um, what was it like for your family when The Power of One came out? Because your dad found fame later in life, didn't he? Yeah. Um, look, it changed everything. Um, it also changed him. He talked about, and this is all in the book, uh, start of what he called the third act of his life, which was a period when he decided to follow his dreams, do what he liked, uh, be ambitious, um, write the great novel, all that sort of thing, which of course is what he did and succeeded beyond his and everybody's dreams, really. Wild um, imagination. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It changed us. It changed him, but it also changed us. I, I think I was more subconscious than anything. I decided to leave the country. I think I felt subconsciously what was coming and I didn't want to be too close to it. Um, How I old see were my you at that stage? I would have been 25, 26 when, he, when the power of one came out, about 26, yeah. Um, it was a, a, a global phenom phenomenon. Oh, it, was a, it was a big, it was a big book. It, uh, yeah, yeah, look, it was a global phenomenon. Yes, it's true. It was. No it escaping it. Did you see like it on, you would have seen it on double decker buses and stuff. Yeah, no, well, see, I, I saw it all over the place and I saw him in the press saying things. This is part of the story. And if, if out there you want to read it, it's all about the things he started talking about that were not true. Um, but I won't go into that. Um, stuff, though, wasn't it? Just he, he used he used he used the fame in a not a very in what I believe is not a very good way. Um, but when you have, when you have a famous person around you, you notice the changes in that person, and then you find yourself doing and saying things you don't actually believe in, often to protect that person. So fame makes you forgive bad behaviour. It makes you look the other way. I didn't like the changes in him, and I didn't like the changes in myself. Fame gulls you into thinking you are something that you are not. It's a synthetic, I call it a synthetic state of being. It's not a real one. And so fame is, you think, wow, you made a million dollars, blah, blah, blah. But it's a double-edged sword, I can, I can assure you of that. Mm, sometimes getting what you want is, um, be careful what you wish for goes. Listen. Exactly. Be careful what you wish for. Um, he took it and he grasped it. He'd been waiting. This is the third act of his life and he took it, but he took it a little bit too much, in my opinion. But that's all in the book. It can happen. Yeah. yeah, no, I can't. I can't. I've, I've been privileged to read some of the early chapters. Um, I sent you a photo of this when I was in Melbourne, but this is my copy of The Power of One, which I contacted. And oh, yes. Yeah. I, with a lot of possessiveness, this book belongs to Jessica Muddard. <laughs> Do not steal it. This is mine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so do you, it's coming out next year. Which when where it's will... coming out August twenty five. August, uh, I believe. It's it's it's. The, I don't know how the publishers thinks. So it's Hachette. Um, I think I guess they think it's a Father's Day book. So it's coming out. I think sometime in August for 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 the Father's Day market which I've never been involved in. I don't know what the Father's Day market is, but I guess it's when you bring out Bryce Courtney books, I suppose. <laughs> it's a big thing. What's something um, for both of you, both having had traditionally successful careers as authors, that is something that is out of reach to the majority of people. What's yeah. something that, you know, we might find surprising about what it's actually like, whether that's good or bad? Yeah, look, I, 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 what people have to understand is uh, it's no different probably to the careers that anybody else has out there. 
uh, think people seem to think because they look at people like Bryce or other well-known writers, they think it's about having a big hit, and and sometimes it is. It did happen for him, but it's a bit like um, I, I think it's a little bit like the guy or the girl who wrote ten books nobody ever heard of, and then suddenly gets a smash hit, and suddenly you're an overnight success. Uh, mm. I, I don't think I've even got to the overnight success yet. I'm still waiting for that. <laughs> but I've had a modicum of success, a modicum, I would say. Um, what I'm trying to say is that it's just a career like anything else. It takes hard graft to get to the top. And those who have amazing first hits are very, very rare. My dad was one of them, but you also have to have the talent and I think determination to keep it going. Bryce, for instance, got very lucky first up, but he was not a one-hit wonder. He worked his yeah. backside off. Put those things together, the luck. Yes, he had luck for the first book. Everybody wanted it. He came, it came out just as Apartheid was looking like it was ending, the power of one. So it was perfectly timed. Sure. He also had the talent and he also had the perseverance. And those are the formula you really need for real success. And that's not easy to maintain. He did it, and nobody has ever come close to what he did in this country, in my opinion. Yeah, no. Um, did he, I don't think anyone has. Um, I'm so sure because that, this is the thing I always say, until you put your book in the world, you don't know the public reaction to it, whether that's exactly. indifference. Indifference is the worst. Um, or whether it will take off. Did When your dad was writing The Power of One, did he have doubt along the way? Oh, total, total doubt. Uh, but as I was reading it, I didn't. I had less doubt than he did. Um, I think... It was a story that had been building in his brain since he was 20-something years old. And the funny thing is, and I talk about it in the book, so much of what he eventually wrote I'd actually heard. I always almost think uh, that he was beta testing everyone throughout his life, saying, telling a story that eventually ends up in the power of one, just to see what people's reaction is. So he's trying all the stories out. So he's beta testing everything with his friends or his family or whatever. Um, and then you finally say, oh, I know that. You told me that story when I was 12 or something. So, it, it yeah, um, I reckon it, but the, the point is this book had been bubbling in his brain for at least 30 years. And when it finally came gushing out, um, I went, oh, my God, um, he's finally got it. He's, got, he's put it together into an idea that's just coming out brilliantly. And I knew this was going to be a bestseller as soon as I read it started reading it from the first chapter on i just going give me the next dad give me the next chapter please please i want to read it he said oh is it really good he said he was a bit scared he didn't know that he didn't know um every you know, he was always he was always scared of other people's reactions interesting did you you called him dad then when you're talking did you call him dad or bryce oh uh, look i don't know <laughs> that's good thing. i will call him dad I, I, it must be subconscious. I don't know why I call him dad one moment and Bryce the next. Probably I'm talking about Bryce, the Bryce, the phenomenon, and dad, my dad. And there might be something in that. You, maybe the um, psychologist mm. can help me out with that one. Yeah, it's fascinating. It's fascinating. I just cannot wait to read this book in August. Um, where can people connect with you, Adam? Obviously through Henbury Books if you would like book coaching. Adam is yep. available. He's also available for manuscript assessments. Um, so please get in touch via the website. And for yourself, Adam, if people would like to grab a book or something or contact you. Yeah, look, uh, you, uh, they're available at all good bookstores, as I say, but mostly um, Amazon has all my books, uh, you know, all the um, Booktopia, they're all there. Um, well, you're, so I mean, you've had big publishing houses behind you, except with the exception of your first book, which you self-published. That's right. Uh, Amazon, man. Uh, look, so, uh, and that's why I said to you, there's this, here I am, I was the son of the most famous writer in the country and I couldn't get a gig. I, I could nobody wanted to publish me. So don't think it's, you know, it was that, that I, I started writing Amazon men in 2005 or six. Mm. Um, I, I've self, I had it published by a, a British publisher um in 2016 that's roughly 11 10 11 years before i i and it worked out okay because another publisher got their hands on it said okay we like this we think it's good we're not sure it's what something we'd ever have published what do you got and that's where i came out with the ship that never was so this is how yeah, things yeah. happen they read they read your self-published thing they think it's good and they give you a chance with the publisher mm. and that's what happened with me but it took 11 12 years before i i got a chance 
Mm, okay. Okay. There are a lot of gold nuggets in this for people who are writing. Um, thanks so much for your time, Adam. That was amazing. A pleasure, Jess. And I'm really looking forward to, to working with people. And, um, you know, I, hopefully I can give the benefit of my experience, such as it is, to, to anyone out there who, who really needs some help. Thanks, Adam. Thank you very much for having me.